You know, it is remarkable that uh, there was that there was nothing remarkable that night, that the girls seemed to be behaving normally. In, in your investigator's mind, what is remarkable, remarkable about that? What can we infer? Hello and welcome to True Crime Rocket Science, the most authentic voice in true crime. Nothing was out of the ordinary. How does that translate to the number five clue we all missed? At 1 minute 37 within this News Nation clip, and I'll put a link to that in the description, the reporter says, you mentioned that it is remarkable that there was nothing remarkable that night. Former CIA and FBI agent Tracy Walder makes such an excellent point, saying at every stage along their journey home from the corner club, they had no reason to believe they were in danger. So we get remarkable insight just in that from them that they didn't perceive any unusual threat, not from someone they knew and not from a stranger. Of all the experts that you hear talking about true crime, I find Tracy Walder to be the best. But even so, I've tended to take the opposite view, that this crime didn't happen because everything was perfect. Something had to be wrong for someone. But if we take Walder's statement at face value, that all along their trip home that night, the walk to the food truck, the interactions around the food truck, the drive home in the taxi, if we accept that there wasn't anything remarkable about that and that it was normal behavior for them, I think it raises an interesting question. And this is the vital fifth clue that we've all missed. Before we get to that, if you haven't subscribed to the channel, please do. Welcome to the thousands of you that have subscribed and also the dozens of you that have joined Patreon. If you're enjoying this episode, please share it to your social media and networks that are discussing this case. Like, share, leave a comment and let's get started. So in what way could their quote unquote normal behavior be upsetting to someone in particular? And we sort of covered that with a little bit of uh, sound clips from Elliot Roger. How could someone else be behaving normally, be upsetting to someone in particular? Well, if they didn't perceive danger, if the victims didn't perceive any kind of danger in terms of the events of that night, isn't it because the, the danger arose on some other night or as a result of an accumulation of perception from someone else? In other words, was the breaking point, the inflection point for someone who's related to this case, was it three weeks earlier, six months earlier, what is the period of time we need to be looking at? I think it's also interesting to remember this idea that the neighborhood of the funhouse, as well as the funhouse itself, was particularly, in fact, peculiarly silent for a Saturday night. And so how could that context be triggering? I suppose one theory we could draw from this is the idea that if you're not having a party and not doing things with all your favorite people, then who should you be hanging out with? Who should you be, who should you be reaching out to? If you've been too busy partying and with friends, who should you be paying attention to that you haven't? And in that context, if you then still don't pay attention to that person, what does that look like? What does that feel like? So while Walder's take on the events is a useful way to think about it, that it was all very, very normal, and while this does actually negate um, behavior arising out of some negative incident that night by someone who was part directly part of their interactions in public, I do think we must reconcile that thinking with the idea that their interactions were nevertheless meaningful and not entirely without incident. The business of what was told to Adam and telling Adam everything and ditching a puppy-eyed Romeo hanging out on the sidelines, I think that even if it's normal, is nevertheless a fabric that someone else found themselves in and it didn't feel very good to them. Does that make sense? Once again, all of this normalness, how could that feel unpleasant to someone else? You might also say, I had a normal Christmas and someone else might respond to that thinking of it in a painful sense, perhaps because they didn't. As adults, our identities and pairing and future paths have been settled, right? But at this age, all of these aspects are in flux. And in some ways, it might be a fairy tale that is starting to come true for some 
while for others it might be a nightmare. For someone, their identity, their partner, perhaps even their lifetime partner, and thus their entire future was in tatters while Kaylee and Maddie were going on with a normal night. Or as Maddie's father said, you know, she was just getting the life that she deserved. Well, who wasn't? Now, you may not think so, but for someone who lacks a certain kind of agency, a breakup can instantly and irrevocably change the course of their life history. Your destiny and fate can swivel from somewhere warm and fuzzy to somewhere else cold and lonely at the drop of a hat, or perhaps the drop of a hint. So that is the number five clue we all missed, right? And it has to do with it being completely normal for the victims. And in what way was that unsettling to the perpetrator? Now, in the Kylie Rodney case, when we reached around this point, the number five clue, number six clue, that was when we eventually found out what had really happened with Kylie. Well, we're now moving beyond that milestone in terms of this case. How many clues is it going to take to actually solve this? So I'm not going to take it further than that, but I am going to deal with something else, something else I've been meaning to address, and it comes from the same News Nation clip. It's this image. Look at the words on the banner. Brave, bold, unstoppable. You can imagine the kids in the funhouse seeing those words and being inspired by them. And you really do get a sense that Kaylee, Kaylee for one, had transformed a great deal from a little girl with a little boy boyfriend to someone a lot more sophisticated. Her new vehicle also communicated that sense of herself. Kaylee went from this to this. In other words, she upgraded. She upgraded herself and her car. What else happens when you, as a person, upgrade your life? You may move somewhere else. You may move on to a different job and a different income, a different lifestyle. But you can also sever certain linkages that you consider downgrades to yourself or something that you have uh, transcended in a way, such as an old car or a high school sweetheart. Gabby Petita was also in the process of trying to upgrade who she was, Brian, meanwhile, in that scenario, seemed to want to keep things under control. He wanted to keep things sort of the way they were, keep his girlfriend the way she was, keep the status of their relationship in a sort of stuck sense. But the ships of youth aren't made for harbors. They're designed for the open seas and for living. And when one ship wants to sail out of that harbor and another one wants to sort of tie it down, anchor it down, well, that is a recipe for crisis and heartache. On the 18th of October, around the three-week mark to the murders, the University of Idaho Facebook page posted this mantra, Brave, bold, unstoppable. Although it isn't exactly clear what Kaylee decided to do, decided to be with Jack, but ending a serious five-year relationship is huge, no matter how old you are. But when you're 21, it's particularly huge. You're basically deciding to change your own and someone else's destiny. Now, you may think semantics and the University of Idaho marketing are accidental or incidental to operative everyday psychology. But when you think about it, on social media, we are constantly aware of messages that can and do reinforce how we do or how we want to feel about certain things. Especially when you're in a state of conflict about something, you may sort of um, be in a state of floundering and sort of searching, where can I get some support for this difficult situation I feel online? It's Christmas right now at the time that I wrote this, and you also want to find a message in a card or online that really says distinctively, uh, uniquely, what you want to say. Sometimes you look for that message, and sometimes it finds you. For as long as I've been writing about true crime, I've always been very interested in this idea of what was the media context or the narrative context in the sense of where was the killer drawing strength or drawing inspiration or drawing ideas from? Was he listening to... 
uh, true crime podcast, and we know in the Gabby Petito case that was a factor. In the Morphew case, we also know that was a factor as well. Um, what music were they listening to? What books were they reading? What was on television at the time? In the Chris Watts case, you had Shanann who was drawing her inspiration uh, almost exclusively from Thrive. You know, if we draw a certain amount of our, our daily psychology from the media that we surround ourselves with, you know, haven't you ever played a song over and over again at a particular time or uh, found a book particularly uh, inspiring or movie and you've watched it over and over? Um, sometimes you need that reinforcement when you're going through a time that you know what you need to do, but you're not quite sure how to feel about it or what exactly to do about it. Intertextually, when I studied the Watts case in depth, I don't think Chris Watts missed the meaning behind this message. Frederick Colorado, built on what matters. Was, did he feel like he was building on what he, what he thought mattered to him? Was he building a life on what he felt um, was meaningful to him? Right, And he would have seen that because he lived in that town. He would have seen that over and over again. And again, his symbolic construct means absolutely nothing to you, but it means absolutely everything to him. We're going to come back to the University of Idaho case, but think about what Chris Watts, what we knew he was listening to on the day of the murders. We know what music he was listening to. The discovery in the Watts case shows how Watts googled lyrics to quote in his lovey-dovey cards to his mistress. So why wouldn't he use it as inspiration to do something that he was very conflicted about? And he was. In the Chris Watts case, on discovery page 2122, at 10 minutes past 10 in the morning, and this was just after the murder of his family, he googled lyrics for Battery by Metallica. So he'd just done something. And now he's looking for reinforcement in the emotional aftermath. The discovery goes on to say, to, to, to repeat these lyrics from Metallica, lashing out the action, return, returning the reaction, weak are ripped and torn away, hypnotizing power, crushing all that cower. Smashing through the boundaries, lunacy has found me, cannot stop the battery, pounding out aggression, turns into obsession, Cannot kill the battery, cannot kill the family. Battery is found in me. On another page in the discovery, it refers to what's having a proven, having proven a keen interest in song lyrics. And it says here, he is no doubt familiar with this song's lyrics. He attended a Metallica concert held in Denver on June 7, 2017. When he wrote a card for Nicole Kessinger, he also googled uh, song lyrics in order to draw inspiration from that he said things like when i'm around you i can feel peace um, if i'm ever cold i can count on you to heat me up with your presence and at the lowest level you can make me feel like i'm sky high there were other lyrics quoted by watts in a card he wrote to kessinger on the same date that he googled these lyrics Bear in mind, just as dumping someone, including a wife or husband, may be one of the most important decisions ever, well, so is murder. So there is likely a need to justify it, to find inspiration as well. Chris Watts probably listened to this on the day before the murders as well. These are song lyrics from, I think it's Unforgiven. New blood joins this earth, and quickly he's subdued. Through constant pain, disgrace, the young boy learns their rules. With time the child draws in, this whipping boy done wrong. Deprived of all his thoughts, the, the young man struggles on and on. He's known, ooh, a vow unto his own that never from this day his will they'll take away. Now, tattoos perform the same function. We try to inspire ourselves and others with words and symbols. You might think, well, yes, I do. Well, the killer does as well. Casey Anthony did with the Bella Vita tattoo, which she got in July 2008, when her daughter Kaylee was already actively missing. So brands and branding do have a push or pull impact on us. I wrote about that all of these motifs and messages in my book on Chris Watts with the word Cassandra in its title. So what did brave, bold, unstoppable mean to the killer? 
did he draw inspiration from that as well? So some of the students were drawing uh, inspiration in a certain positive way, perhaps, brave, bold, unstoppable. How did the killer perhaps draw inspiration from that as well? Well, perhaps while f watching football. And then this is where it gets interesting. What about the key identifier of the of Idaho, the University of Idaho? What about the key identifier, the idea of a vandal? If the killer was home alone, yet again, bored, floundering in search of inspiration, searching for some way to mitigate or soothe a clanging sensation of social death, he may have turned to the most obvious and logical anchor, his alma mater. What am I? What is a vandal? What am I supposed to be? Well, what is a vandal? It is someone who willfully or ignorantly destroys. A vandal is based on a group of people, right, who were well known for destroying property. In the year 455, the vandals sacked Rome. And this is what history shows us the vandals looked like. And exactly the journey we're going to go on now, just being curious, who are vandals, right? And you can imagine someone who has got nothing better to do, everyone else is parting, might be looking at, woefully looking at the um, vandals marketing somewhere on the campus and then thinking, where does that come from? You know, with time on their hands, where does that come from? And, and finding out about that and then finding out that the vandals were actually real warriors from history. And what were their weapons? What were the weapons of vandals? Well, they were long stabbing weapons. They were swords. A bored student with too much time on his hands might use that idleness to find out more about the vandals, his peers at the University of Idaho were constantly associating themselves with. You know, even, and I find this really interesting, even in the background images of the house of 1122 King Road, you see the water tower sort of rising in the background. You can see it very clearly from the porch, and it's got a big eye on it. And so wherever you were, you would actually be seeing that eye on the water tower to be a constant reminder of what is going on. And it's kind of on the horizon. It's kind of saying to you, you need to be this, or this is where you're going. And so you might eventually, after seeing it dozens of times, even hundreds of times, start to wonder, who are they? Who were they? Who am I supposed to be? And this lesson from Wikipedia, this history lesson would have been just one click away. In 456, a vandal fleet of 60 ships threatening both Gaul and Italy was ambushed and defeated by the Western Roman general Rissimer. In 457, the following year, a mixed vandal Berber army returning with loot from a raid in Campania was soundly defeated in a surprise attack by Western Emperor Marjorian at the mouth of the whatever river. And so it's about threatening, it's about raiding, it's about a surprise attack. So what happens when someone attacks you, destroys you? What would the vandals of history do? Well, on Saturday night, the vandals football team, right, the Idaho vandals were destroyed in terms of a football game. They lost 44-26. And so what should you do? If you lose, what should you do? Why retaliate, of course? That's what vandals do. Brave, bold, unstoppable. unstoppable. As a result of the vandal sack of Rome and piracy in the Mediterranean, it became important to the Roman Empire to destroy the vandal kingdom. In 460, a uh, Roman leader called Majorian launched an expedition against the vandals, but he was defeated at the Battle of Cartag Cartagena. In 468, the Western and Eastern Roman Empires launched an enormous expedition against the Vandals under the command of Basiliscus, which reportedly was composed of 100,000 soldiers and 1,000 ships. But the Vandals defeated the invaders at the Battle of Cap Bon, capturing the Western fleet and destroying the Eastern through the use of fire ships. Well, what are fire ships? Now, according to Wikipedia, a fire ship was used in the days of wooden road or sailing ships 
And what happened was they would fill the ship with combustibles, with gunpowder, and it was deliberately set on fire and steered into an enemy fleet in order to destroy ships or to create panic and make the enemy break formation. Just think about this idea of sending a ship inside a fleet and the whole idea is to destroy that entire fleet, to destroy the formation and to destroy your enemy, right? Now, if someone had decided that the enemy was inside that house, 1122, how would you try to create a fire ship? How would you deal with that situation? Following up the attack, the vandals tried to invade, invade another group but were driven back by uh, another group with heavy losses. In retaliation, the vandals took 500 hostages, hacked them to pieces, and threw the pieces overboard on the way to Carthage. So someone who was sort of perhaps interested in who the vandals were would have learned what they did and may have identified to some extent with that, perhaps went into the history further and further, deeper and deeper. In 469, the Vandals gained control of Sicily, but were forced by Odeker to relinquish it in 477, except for the western part of Lilibaeum, lost in 491 after a failed attempt on their part to retake the island. The other thing is, as a student, perhaps they were studying history, and perhaps the study of history led to the study of this history. And perhaps the student went into particular detail into this area. In the 470s, the Romans abandoned their policy of war against the Vandals. The Western general Rissima reached a treaty with them, and in 476, Genseric was able to conclude a perpetual peace with Constantinople. Relations between the two states assumed a veneer of normality. And so in the aftermath to this, the Vandals had fended off attacks from the Romans and established a hegemony over the islands of the Western Mediterranean. So can you see how there's this contest for power, and how is power lost or um, reclaimed? Well, through, through the shedding of blood, through violence. In ancient tribal memory, we know that to maintain control and also to survive, one must attack those who threaten us. One must be brave, bold, and unstoppable. If you were thinking this very late at night, perhaps sleep-deprived, forlorn, and perhaps coming off a beer or two, perhaps a moment of blind anger, it may have seemed the right thing to do, to instantly restore the balance of power. Once upon a time, it was our default setting. If you think all of that is far-fetched, a lot of the music that people listen to are violent, and if you take Iron Maiden, for example, There's an article, I'll put a link to that in the description. It's from Vice, and it says, Some friends of mine in New Jersey had a theory about Iron Maiden. They surmised that the first five Maiden albums were perfect metal records, mainly because every song was about, alluded to, or conjured up images of killing. And if you take the lyrics to The Trooper, these are them them from Iron Maiden. I'll just do the first paragraph. You'll take my life, but I'll take yours too. You'll fire your musket, but but I'll run you through. So when you're waiting for the next attack, you'd better stand. There's no turning back. The final lyrics of that song, it's called The Trooper, are And as I lay there gazing at the sky, my body's numb and my throat is dry. And as I lay forgotten and alone, without a tear, I draw my parting groan. If you were ever a young person, you may have gotten dizzy or drunk on certain lyrics and imagined the world to be this grand adventure or this grand conspiracy or this grand vendetta. Didn't you ever get caught up when you were very young on certain ideas? Isn't that what happened to this killer? So what is the fabric he was drawing on? Because there was a fabric. Be bold, be brave, unstoppable. But what was the rest? Thank you for listening and I'll see you guys next time.